Hi everyone, this is part one of a series I wanted to create to kind of show uh, the roots of the Impressionism, where Impressionism actually kind of falls into art history, uh, who the Impressionists actually were, uh, and to kind of dispel some of the ideas, uh, rumors, and uh, misconceptions about the group itself. Uh, again, when you look at the group that is the Impressionists, we kind of have to go a little bit farther back uh, than the group and to kind of understand how the group formed and uh, the importance of, of their formation, we really kind of have to examine uh, what's occurring in the art world, specifically within Paris, uh, that, that leads to kind of this breakaway and uh, this development of modern art. The first thing we really have to think about uh, is the salon. The salon is really the ruling factor uh, when it comes to art uh, in France at this time, uh, and some could even argue even farther out uh, than that. And what this is, is this is a juried exhibition uh, where you have a few select members uh, who are thought to be art experts essentially receiving submissions from the, uh, from the, from the public uh, and then displaying these pieces uh, for the public to come and see. Uh, again, the, the, the problem with this was if you didn't make it into the system, uh, then you didn't get your work shown and, and essentially you had no livelihood. Uh, a quick history here. Uh, the Salon itself, the first exhibition was uh, in 1674. Uh, the, uh, the, Pal uh, the Palace of the Louvre, the Salon de Paris uh, from 1725. In 1737, we have the first time it's open to the public. Uh, 1748, we have the juried system. We then have the French Revolution. Uh, in 1863, we have the Salon de Refuse uh, introduced. And again, this is just the Salon of the Refused works. We'll talk about that. Uh, in 1870, we have the Franco-Prussian War. This is a major incident uh, in terms of what's occurring. Uh, in 1881, we have the government withdrawing their sponsorship from the Salon itself. Uh, and in 1890, we have the end of the Salon system. Uh, Here's a view into what you would actually see within the scope of the salon. Again, uh, if we look at the, the, the people on the bottom, this is kind of this collection of, of every day uh, from people, uh, every walk of life you can imagine. And as you can see, the work is very much hung uh, from the floor to the ceiling uh, with the larger paintings being on the top and, and kind of gravitating down. But there was a specific hierarchy that we'll examine uh, in terms of the work. A lot of this, again, is this idea of, of trying to find a quantify or a, a quantified method to kind of gauge art at the time, to understand what is good uh, and what is bad. A lot of this is kind of left over from the neoclassical ideology. Uh, again, here's our hierarchy of works I mentioned. Uh, again, when you think of, of the importance, and this is very much how it was measured, uh, paintings of historical subject matter would have the largest canvas and were the most most respected or, or considered the best, uh, moving down to portraits and then landscapes and genre paintings and at the very, very bottom uh, of what was considered talent-wise uh, with an artist, you would have still lifes. And again, you have to remember these are not only arranged uh, in terms of hierarchy, in terms of their ideology of what's most important, but also in terms of just the size of the canvas itself. Uh, usually with the historical subject matters, you have very large and, and going down, uh, etc. Here we have a view, a painting, uh, showing kind of what the salon atmosphere was like. And as you can see, it's, it's jam-packed in there. Uh, people are very much elbow to elbow, if you will, and the work is very much frame to frame. Frame. So uh, people would kind of get in and out as they could. It, would, it was, uh, you know, very, very busy event, as you can imagine. And again, any viewing of art uh, must have been very difficult if you were uh, either too high up or too close to the floor. Again, we can kind of understand why they developed this hierarchy of paintings uh, with the larger ones, of course, being on the top. Again, this was the modern system that they had kind of developed at the time. And a lot of what we're seeing during this time is the modernization of Europe. Uh, again, when we look back, we had a photo of Nader there. He's a photographer, and this is an important thing to remember. Uh, photography is around at this time as well. Uh, we start off with kind of the bigger aspects of the story with the Universal Exhibition of 1855, uh, somewhat known as the Paris World Fair. 
And this is this exhibition, uh, again, this multicultural exhibition showing the innovations from many different so uh, societies around the world, uh, all with the idea of uh, uh, modernization. Again, this is the World's Fair uh, type of ideology. We have artists uh, uh, from France actually showing uh, uh, within the, the World World's Fair itself. A lot of this is based on a, a previous uh, exhibition, the Crystal Palace from 1851 that was actually held in England. Uh, and again, the Crystal Palace is famous for being made uh, of, of manufactured materials, uh, most noticeably glass. Again, a lot of what we're examining during this time period uh, is really industrialization. We see all of these different aspects of what we think of as modern society uh, kind of being put into place right around this time period. And, and by just viewing these exhibitions, uh, again, the Crystal Palace being in England uh, and the Universal Exhibition being in France, uh, uh, this is kind of the, the thematic of, of, of the moment. This is the Palace of Industry created from 1855 uh, in conjunction with this, of course. And you'll notice that this is a photograph of the building. Uh, this building will, will have uh, importance when we go back and we talk about the Salon of the Refused uh, under Napoleon III a little bit later. But again, uh, this is a culmination of, of different factors, but a lot of this is the showcase of what we have going on in modern society. Uh, industrialization, as I mentioned, but this is also the first time period that painters can do things like buy paint from tubes and, and things of this nature. We have a lot of uh, uh, lighting uh, being constructed within Paris itself. The city itself goes through a period of, of kind of uh, revitalization if you will, and it is also import, uh, important to remember we do have the Franco-Prussian War uh, occurring during our scope of time as well. Uh, that majorly damages the city, uh, and as we move forward, a lot of the remaking of the city is in this modern fashion. So when we view a lot of these culminating factors together, a lot of this is kind of us moving from what we think of uh, uh, as this previous period of time of, of, of uh, uh, you know, even this not necessarily Renaissance standard, but kind of closer to that ideology uh, moving forward into to what we would think of as the contemporary. I'm really just showing a few different images here from the inside uh, of this structure. And again, when you look at this and you look at how it's actually constructed, you can see this curvature of beams on the top. And these are uh, metal beams that have been uh, obviously uh, uh, pre-manufactured in addition to the glasses that are actually used. But as I mentioned, this is a, a universal showcase and we have a lot of different countries uh, actually showing there. And one of the countries we have is actually Japan. Uh, this plays a major input on, on some of the work that we see later. Uh, this is kind of the reintroduction of Japan uh, into the European cycle. And again, we see this in not only this uh, exhibition, but a later one later that will have a heavy effect on the artists. But from the 1855 exhibition, who we have uh, of major importance is Gustav Courbet. Uh, this is an artist we will speak about uh, in, in greater extent uh, in another lecture, but uh, what he actually does is he has uh, several works accepted to the kind of the exhibition that's being held uh, to showcase the arts of France, but several of his larger paintings actually weren't accepted and this kind of uh, caused a fury within him, so to speak. So what he actually does uh, is he sets up his own exhibition uh, right in conjunction with where the majority of the rest of the art is shown. Uh, we have some of the more famous works by Gustave Courbet, Beryl at Ornans, uh, being shown in this tiny little uh, uh, tent, I believe, is, is, is what it is. And again, uh, the importance of Gustave Courbet uh, as an artist is something we'll examine much closer when we actually look at him uh, and what he actually does for the Impressionist movement, but it is important to remember that uh, he is establishing essentially his own salon or his own uh, exhibition. And, and again, uh, this is directly in conjunction with the ideology that we'll see later uh, from the Impressionists, this idea of bucking the system, of not accepting uh, what the salon has to offer. Uh, another very famous painting we have from Courbet uh, uh, that is shown uh, the artist's studio 
a very long title with this one, A Real Allegory, Summing Up Seven Years of My Artistic and Moral Life. Uh, and again, we'll examine this painting much closer when we actually talk about Gustave Courbet as an artist. Uh, but again, this idea that the system has been established, this is kind of the, the bigger ideology that I'm trying to kind of have within this lecture that when you look at what was occurring, uh, we have this system in place. It's almost a quantified system of, of how art is measured uh, through the salon. And again, we have these early instances of, of people kind of pushing against the system. Uh, this is some images. This is actually a photograph of the salon uh, from 1885, just to give you an idea of some of the work that was actually shown in the salon. Uh, as you can see, as I mentioned, this comes from more of a classical framework. Uh, again, this idea of showing uh, almost this mythological aspect of reality, whether we, we, we stir it through the concept of religion uh, or through this classical idea of the nude or a historical allegory, uh, that's really what was acceptable in terms of art. And again, uh, if we think back just to the images that we've seen from Gustave Courbet, uh, even the paintings that he's doing are radically against uh, what we're seeing. The next major event that we have, uh, as I mentioned before, was the Salon of the Refused Work uh, introduced by Napoleon III in 1863. As you can see, we're actually going back to the exact same building. Uh, essentially what happens, long story short, uh, is there are so many pieces that were refused to the Salon uh, that Napoleon III, by public outcry, creates a, a second Salon, a Salon of the Refused Work, and again, this just had all of the work that was uh, refused to the regular uh, a salon. And, and the interesting thing about this, again, uh, is they're kind of removing uh, uh, the tight constraint of what what art could be in in in, uh, in a sense within this. And again, a lot of this was considered uh, almost like a freak show kind of atmosphere. This is where we have uh, Edward Manet's very, very famous Luncheon on the Grass. Uh, Edward Manet is another artist we will talk about in great length uh, in a future lecture. He had a major impact uh, on the Impressionists both uh, as a friend, again, he was direct friends with a lot of these people, but also in the style of his art. Again, when we look at what's occurring in this painting, uh, in reference to the photograph we saw of the Salon images, we can see this is a, a major step in a different direction. Uh, and again, a lot of uh, speculation is that, that Manet really didn't intend this to be accepted. And, and when this was shown uh, in the Salon of the Refuse, uh, uh, you really have to kind of think of it uh, uh, as being this big public outcry for the first time of his style of work. Uh, another very famous painting we have is James uh, Whistler's Symphony in White Number no. 1. Uh, James Whistler, uh, as again another artist we'll speak of, uh, is actually an American artist, worked predominantly in England, and this painting caused a huge amount of controversy because uh, of the association of the white dress uh, with aspects of, of virginity and, and that type of thing. And if you look at how she's, uh, her facial expression is in the rug and all of the different aspects, uh, this is thought to be kind of a wedding night and that's how it was publicly uh, thought of in terms of a painting. Uh, we have some wonderful little sketches. I believe these are by Daumier. Uh, and, and these just kind of show the public reaction to the Salon of the Refused Work. Again, we, uh, uh, pardon me, actually, on the left we have uh, this idea kind of showing how people would react to what they would actually see uh, at the salon itself. And again, uh, if you think about the fact we have these kind of caricatures of these uh, women in the background of, of these neoclassical goddesses that they would have painted, uh, the average woman would, of course, have no way of relating directly to that in terms of her body. And uh, uh, certain artists and cartoonists of the time kind of made fun of that.